At this time, please welcome LPI senior researcher Jennifer DePauli for welcoming and introductory remarks. Thank you, Nicole. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here with you all today. My name is Jen DePauli, and I am a senior researcher at the Learning Policy Institute. We appreciate you taking the time to attend today's webinar. This webinar, excuse me, presented in co-sponsorship with AASA, the, State, the Superintendents Association, the National Association of State Boards of Education, the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, the National Association of State Directors of Teacher Education and Certification, Ed Prep Lab, and the Sold Alliance is the fourth in our six-part series on transforming state education policy through a whole child approach. In our previous webinars, we dove into what the science of learning and development tells us about how districts can implement whole child design in schools and how states can set a whole child vision and support schools in transforming learning environments. At its core, the science suggests that schools that optimally enable healthy development, learning and success integrate structures and practices that enable positive developmental relationships, learning environments filled with safety and belonging, rich learning experiences and knowledge development, the development of skills, habits, and mindsets, and integrated support systems for all children. Building from these design principles for schools, today we will be diving into how we can build adult capacity and expertise for whole child school design based on the science of learning and development and drawn from our whole child policy toolkit. You can find the toolkit at the link in the chat. And now I'd like to hand it over to two of my amazing colleagues, Marjorie Weschler, Principal Research Manager at LPI, and Maria Heiler, Senior Researcher at LPI and Director of the Ed Prep Lab, to talk about how we can build the capacity and expertise of school leaders and teachers and why that is so important. Marjorie, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. When we talk about building adult capacity, many people immediately think about the teachers, but it's also important to consider school leaders. It's the leaders who prioritize a whole child education. They develop teachers' knowledge and skills to implement a whole child approach in the classroom, principals manage and improve their schools, and they are critical in building the positive whole child school environments where students and teachers can thrive. A critical question then is how do we prepare and develop principals who can make whole child education possible? We conducted a comprehensive review of the research to understand the features of high quality principal learning. We found that what principals learn matters. They need to learn instructional leadership, which means knowing how to develop students' higher order thinking and how to select effective curricula and materials. They need to learn how to improve schools by doing things such as using a variety of data to inform how they move forward. They need to learn how to establish positive school environments by creating collaborative work environments for teachers and working with families and community stakeholders. They need to learn about staff development and how to help teachers improve their practice. And they need to learn how to meet the needs of all learners. We also found that in addition to what principals learn, how they learn matters. Especially important are applied learning opportunities such as inquiry projects based on real schools. Internships are important where pre-service principals take on the responsibilities of a leader. Expert coaches or mentors who can provide support and guidance contribute in important ways to principal learning. And so does being in cohorts or networks, having a group of professionals to learn together. So we know what makes for high quality learning. It's, the, it's having the important content together with the powerful learning strategies. And having these learning opportunities is important to develop principals leadership knowledge and skills, but they also matter to other important school outcomes, including teacher retention and student achievement. A study in California shows that if a principal had low quality preparation, the probability of a teacher staying in their school would be 78% on average. But if a principal had high quality preparation, the probability is up to 89%. Likewise, there's a strong connection between principals' professional development and academic gains for students. 
A student whose principal had more access to professional development had higher projected learning gains. And these gains are equivalent to an additional 29 instructional days in English and three months worth of additional math instruction. And importantly, these achievement gains are especially notable for historically underserved students of color, defined here as Black, Latino, and Native American students. So principal learning really does make a big difference for principals, teachers, and students. But do principals have access to the high quality learning opportunities that foster these outcomes? Well, yes and no, mostly no at this point. Um, on the positive side, most principals do have some access to the important content and access to this content has increased over time. So principals certified in the uh, most recent 10 years were more likely to report access to important content than more veteran principals. However, not many principals had access to the authentic job-based learning. Only about half experienced internships with coaching or regularly participated in a principal network. And access to the high quality learning varies by school poverty level. So principals in low poverty schools had a lot more access to important content as shown in this slide and more access to those impactful learning strategy. Which brings me to the role of policy in shaping principal learning, because we found that policies can support both the quality of principal learning and access to it. So I'll share two examples, starting with the state of California. Between 2011 and 2017, California revised its leadership standards to emphasize things such as educating diverse learners, developing staff, and involving stakeholders. And these performance expectations were translated into program approval standards and new expectations for both pre-service training and induction. These policies changed principal learning in the state. More recently prepared principals in California had greater access to learning about key topics than veteran principals, and they were also more likely to have those problem-based learning approaches that were part of the new program expectations. In another example, the Principal Pipeline Project funded by the Wallace Foundation was intended to create a steady supply of well-prepared and well-supported principals. It was piloted in six cities across the US and they all shared common strategies, such as adopting standards to guide principal preparation, hiring, evaluation, and support. They delivered high quality preparation, often in partnerships with local universities. They use data on candidate skills to inform hiring and to match candidates to schools, and they aligned principal evaluation and support. In all six cities, students in schools led by principals in the initiative outperformed those in comparison schools, and the principals were more likely to remain in their schools. So we know that policies can make a difference. So what can states and districts do? They can use licensure and program approval standards to ensure that programs include important features such as quality internships and coaching. They can invest in professional learning by funding leadership academies and paid internships. They can make sure that preparation and professional development include content on how to support diverse student bodies, and they can direct resources to high poverty schools to equalize access to principal learning or do things like underwrite preparation for prospective principals who will work in those schools. And they can build those local, local pipelines that identify teachers with strong leadership potential and carry them through their preparation and ongoing learning. In some, access to high quality professional learning matters for principal success, especially those implementing new models like a whole child approach and it matters to their teachers and students. I'm now gonna turn the session over to Maria Heiler to talk about teachers. Thank you, Marjorie. Now that we've heard about some of the ways that principal learning needs to be envisioned and supported, I'm going to drill down a bit into the part of the toolkit that focuses on designing teacher preparation systems for whole child learning and development. As a reminder, this is the framework for guiding principles for whole child design and tells us how schools should be organized to support whole child learning. 
<clears throat> Ed Prep Lab brought together a group of leading teacher, educator, scholars, practitioners, most of who are Ed Prep Lab members, along with policy partners to develop an aligned set of design principles focused on teacher preparation grounded in the science of learning and development. The result is a wheel that looks very similar. This framework, however, while aligned, focuses on how educator preparation programs need to be designed in order to prepare teachers who are able to create, their, create the learning environments that reflect the whole child design principles. I'm gonna take just a few minutes to go through each principle. You'll note that each one focuses on the content of what teacher candidates need to learn, as well as the design features of programs aligned with SOLD. For more information, Ed Prep Lab has a series of learning cafes on the topic, and you can check those out for a deeper dive. So the first principle focuses on a curriculum rooted in a deep understanding of learners, learning, and development. Programs should be designed to prepare educators who can effectively address the complex ways in which children learn and develop. This includes a curriculum that connects subject matter with strategies for an asset-based approach to learning that centers students' backgrounds, families, and community, and equips educators with the understanding of the conditions necessary for optimal brain development in children and adolescents. When state teaching standards and accreditation processes are aligned with the science of learning and development, they better support the ability of programs to create and implement such a program, such a curriculum. The second principle focuses on the development of skills, habits, and mindsets of an educator, an equitable educator. Programs should be designed to develop educators with mindsets that support all students well and equitably. They should model empathy, approaches to social emotional learning and cultural competence and prepare educators to use restorative practices so that all students feel a sense of safety and belonging. This includes supporting and strengthening teacher candidates understanding of how to build partnerships with families, community members and other educators while focusing on children's learning strengths and needs. Programs should prepare educators who understand how contextual realities impact the experiences of their students, their understanding of themselves, and their perceptions of social identities. State standards and accreditation processes that are aligned with the science of learning and development advance practices such as culturally sustaining and responsive pedagogies. Principle three focuses on rich experiential learning opportunities. Programs should be des designed to immerse teacher candidates in rich experiential learning opportunities that are paired with authentic and performance-based assessments. Programs should model a full range of learning experiences as part of their scope and sequence, including practice, feedback, skill development, growth and understanding, and expansion of capacity for adaptive expertise. These type of learning experiences require strong partnerships with districts, communities, and families, which is a common theme across all of these principles. The fourth principle is pedagogical alignment and modeling. Programs should be designed around a coherent version of whole child development, learning, and teaching. They should model a vision of learning and development where instructors, supervisors, and cooperating teachers enact and unpack approaches uh, approaches they expect teacher candidates to use in practice. This includes the integration of theory and practice around a sold aligned vision, which will shape preparation programs and clinical experience, and is made possible, again, by close partnerships between programs, schools, and district. This type of alignment and modeling requires that candidates spend extended time in schools and classrooms with expert mentor teachers to guide their learning and development as they learn to teach. And finally, principle five is supportive developmental relationships and communities of practice. Programs should be designed with structures that give time and space to the development of professional communities of practice that promote active, interactive, constructive, and iterative learning. To do this, programs need strong reciprocal relationships, again, with PK-12 schools. This includes program structures such as teacher residencies, cohorts, and clinical teaching teams that are organized to create opportunities where educators observe one another, share practices, develop plans together, and solve problems collectively. Funding of these types of models of teacher preparation is critical to create a sustainable, diverse teacher workforce. 
We're excited at the potential of these design principles to help preparation programs to organize their work to best prepare teachers to engage in sold aligned deeper learning and equity practices. To do this at scale, however, preparation programs need policies that, ad that advance this type of work. So policy recommendations that support this work come in two buckets, access to high quality preparation and state systems to guide high quality practice. The two buckets work in tandem, like two hands clapping, there's movement there, and they're clapping on beat to produce a strong, stable, and diverse teaching profession. To increase access to high quality preparation, states must provide financial incentives to underwrite the cost of preparation and ensure the cost of becoming a teacher does not prevent an, indiv an individual from accessing high quality and high retention preparation. This also includes support to expand high quality clinical training and the school and university partnerships that I spoke about that can sustain intensive clinical sites and support programs like professional development schools, teacher residencies, grow your own, or registered apprenticeships. Simultaneously, state systems need to be built to guide high quality practice. To do this, states must ensure their standards for teaching reflect what we know about how people learn. Assessments for candidates and program review for preparation programs should reflect and prioritize measuring progress on these standards. And states must also work to support access to comprehensive and high quality induction by investing in accomplished teachers so they can mentor novices. These policy recommendations are stepped towards providing educator preparation programs the support and resources they need to prepare the teachers and leaders our students deserve today and in the future. Thank you. And I'll, I'll now turn it back to Jen. Thank you, Maria and Marjorie, uh, for grounding today's webinar in such great information um, and that background in the science of learning and development and why it's so important that we build adult capacity and expertise for the schools that we want. Um, it's now time for our panel. Uh, today's panel will be moderated by Seth Gerson. Seth serves as program director in the National Governors Association Center for Best Practices, where he works to support governors and their staff on K-12 education issues. Previously, Seth has served as a director of government relations for the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards and as a senior education policy advisor to U.S. Senator Jack Reed of Rhode Island. We're excited to have Seth with us today. On our panel, we have uh, Pender Megan, uh, who serves as the Education Commissioner for the State of Maine and has devoted her career to advancing the mission of public education. She has served as a classroom teacher, a principal of the REAL, the Re Regional Education Alternative Learning School, an alternative and service-based high school for students who have struggled in traditional school settings, and prior to becoming commissioner was the as Assistant Superintendent of the Brunswick School Department. Dr. Patricia Varela is an assistant professor of urban educational leadership in the Department of Educational Leadership at Montclair State University. Dr. Varela's research focuses on implementing equity-oriented leadership through leader responses, programmatic interventions, and preparation. Dr. Varela also studies equity-oriented crisis leadership, examining how school leaders can respond to crises without further harming marginalized communities. And we have Dr. Joan Johnson, who is the Assistant Superintendent of Teacher Education and Licensure at the Virginia Department of Education, an advocate in teacher education for over two decades and a proven leader in program development and teacher preparation accreditation. She is leading the work at the VDOE to expand opportunities for the teaching profession and ensure the Commonwealth school communities have access to high qualified, qualified educators. Most recently, she has facilitated the development of the state's strategic plan for recruitment and retention and led the state in its first registered teacher apprenticeship program with the Department of Labor and Industry. Welcome to you all, and I'm gonna pass it over to Seth. All right, well, thanks, Jen, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, great to be with all of you today, and uh, I just wanna thank LPI and all the great uh, partner organizations that are hosting and uh, sponsoring this webinar today. Like Jen said, I'm Seth Gerson, Program Director for K-12 Education at the National Governors Association. And just a little bit about National Governors Association, our membership are the governors in all 50 states and five territories. And since 1908, we've supported governors primarily by providing them 
uh, with a safe space, a safe forum to regularly connect with each other, to exchange ideas, uh, share promising practices, strategies they're using, challenges they're facing. It's an opportunity for governors to regularly share across party and state lines. And there's a spirit of bipartisanship that infuses all of our work. And that starts with our, our leadership, which is always a current Republican governor and a current Democratic governor. Right now, our chair is Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey, and our vice chair is Governor Spencer Cox of Utah. And we have an executive committee that oversees all of our work uh, that is uh, evenly split between Republican and Democratic governors. And I'm particularly excited for this conversation because it focuses on the intersection of the three big areas that governors are primarily focused on right now. First, academic recovery and support. Second, student and staff mental health and well-being, whole child learning and development. And third, educator recruitment and retention, what the webinar frames as building adult capacity and expertise. So as this webinar reflects, we know all three are interrelated and at NGA, we're certainly supporting governors in that way. You certainly need a strong, stable, high quality educator workforce to effectively address academic recovery and student well-being. And that without addressing the mental health and well-being of students and building strong partnerships between families, schools, and communities, it's very difficult to address the academic needs and gaps that we're seeing right now with, with, with students. So all are connected. So that's a bit of framing and I wanna get started and really move to our, our great lineup that we have for this panel. Commissioner Mankin, I'd like to start with, with you. We know that many states are struggling with educator and staff shortages. What's been your primary efforts to improve educator recruitment and retention for both the short and the long-term in Maine and what's been the catalyst for, for those efforts? Well, thanks for that question. And yes, in Maine, just like across the nation, we also are struggling with an educator workforce uh, shortage. And that goes for the leaders. It was a fascinating previous session around the importance of developing and supporting great leaders for our schools. Um, we have a, a Teach Maine plan that really emphasizes nurturing and supporting and um, giving tremendous respect to the profession of education. And for so many years that has been stripped away by a variety of socioeconomic, political and, and other um, constructs, but we really are working hard in our state to provide educators with the trust, with the respect and with great high level opportunities for ongoing development and learning. Um, we're not leaving any stone unturned in terms of you know, being way out of the box with um, with our efforts to provide them with innovative, we're, we're getting certifications for educators actually as um, innovation engineers. And we're really trying to highlight peer-to-peer -peer professional learning that allows educators to share their expertise with one another. And that goes for cohorts, as was mentioned earlier, and, and building those networks of, of sharing across. And we I guess I would just quickly also add, we have um, an online platform called Engine, and that is where educators are able to share their really innovative work and where they're able to get resources and support one another. And I think that deep respect for the field is one piece of the entire Teach Main plan that's try helping us to try to make this a desirable and fulfilling and professionally recognized opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner. I think that's such an important point that not only the supports and the opportunities you're providing for sharing the expertise across the state, but how you're using the bully pulpit to really speak about professionalism and uh, speak to the importance of, of teaching and being an educator during this, this time. Uh, Dr. Johnson, I'd like to move to you for a similar question. Uh, what's the primary efforts of Virginia in this area on educator recruitment and retention both short and long term, and particularly with that whole child learning and development in mind. You're on mute, Dr. Johnson. I guess just quickly, I would say I must give some context. I think the political landscape does influence um, our state greatly in terms of education. The governor's term is four years, and so we've seen quite a bit 
um, over the last four years, and we just actually have a new governor that came on. So with those changes, that impacts many of our initiatives. And so the new governor's initiatives are very heavily focused on um, giving parental rights, uh, pri like prioritizing teacher excellence and high quality. And through some of those um, initiatives, as well as using more data, I think at the state level to inform and understand and unpack the needs, barriers, and then creating unique um, specific opportunities around some of those. We have learned that quite a bit of the, the challenges are going through quite a few cycles as we are coming out of COVID, the, the needs uh, and demands are changing. We are going through an exit process. Um, that's another phase that I think in our state is unpacking individuals stayed on um, to try to help with the COVID, but now are really exiting with um, high turnover, even more high turnover and with retirement. And so we're really trying to use that data to inform some of our practices and really taking a step back to support our divisions in, in some unique ways in short term and long term. Short term, we're looking at specifically some incentives to hire, recruit, attract, um, and trying to always use the barometer of the whole child as our foundation and trying to make decisions and looking at that as our North Star. Um, as we work with divisions in making decisions about what programs initiate. Um, and so we, we tried to do some of that through our strategic plan, which is referenced in my bio, um, and also looking at some long-term strategies of the apprenticeship model, the teacher apprenticeship model, residencies, and we have quite a few initiatives around principal, inspiring superintendents or inspiring principals where, with networks, as well as where they are receiving some direct mentorship um, and support in trying to retain educators as well as ensuring um, success for high school graduation and graduation. Just a couple of things. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And I think that's, you know, again, an important point, not just the initiatives that you're working on, but um, how turnover also at a, an agency um, can make a difference or, you know, in a political office, how to sustain those efforts across administrations is something that we're, we're always looking at and how to anchor that work in different stakeholders across a state, so there's some continuity. Um, I'd like to, to move to Dr. Varela. Uh, Dr. Varela, uh, similar question to you um, from a programmatic level uh, for, for Montclair State. What has been the primary efforts you've had there to improve educator uh, recruitment and retention? Yeah, I think um, the way that we look at it is twofold. So, you know, we have aspiring leaders who come to us, and I think one of the, the things that is most interesting is we look at our curricular materials to see if they align to what leaders are facing today. Um, literally, our my department meeting before I got on here was about, are we preparing our leaders for the world that they're going to lead in? Um, and thinking about, you know, the Wallace Foundations, um, they did a report, um, and even looking at the LPI report that says principles are incredibly important. One of the things that we see a lot of times in our classes is students are asking, can I do this now? Right. They know that the landscape has changed. They know that the, the the political climate has changed. And particularly in New Jersey, where there's all these like very small districts, you know, you can go from one district to another and, and it's it's night and day. And so one of the things that that's been our focus um, in our department is are our materials giving them what they need to be those highly effective leaders? I mean, I think the data that was shared um, in the talk in the beginning where you see this 89% increase is, you know, it's real, right? You see leaders who are, if they're highly effective, they're able to coach, instructionally lead, manage, um, and support children and their teachers so they stay. Right. And I think the other thing that we do at Montclair, which is really important, is, you know, we have um, we have a center, the center of pedagogy, as well as 
A smaller div division within that, the Montclair State University Network of Education Renewal, uh, it's a mouthful, but one of the things that we work there, me and my colleague Marilyn Davis on, is extending to school districts in New Jersey to see what it, are their needs, how can we improve their efficacy, and how can we support them on the journey. You know, one of the things that New Jersey has going on right now is a lot of different curricula are being passed down right um, to make the the school climate more inclusive and equitable and so you know you have leaders who you know i i always say to leaders is if everything's important nothing's important and so how do we help leaders who are in practice and also in their training identify what are the highest leverage items what are the things that need to happen how do i weave in things in other ways um so that way we do have highly effective leaders who have teachers who want to stay who can recruit teachers um into into their schools and the last thing i'll say is one of the things the reasons i think that's really important is the efficacy of the leader is that you know when i was a teacher and i was a principal prior to covid you know the joy of a school looked different and you know i can hearken back to those memories of you know students that i think about and i'm like oh my gosh i remember that that time that place and i think now because of so many things and because of the pandemic you know that that joy that love of education is gone and so i think if you have highly effective leaders who can signal to that who can say we are recovering that we are working to ensure you know our schools are whole child oriented then I think you have, you know, a better opportunity of retraining, retaining teachers and recruiting teachers. And then you don't have these gaps where some schools I work with, they had 16 teachers absent in one day, right? And so those are some of the things we're thinking on as far as a programmatic level, but also thinking towards the community lens. Thank you, Dr. Barilla, and uh, really resonates with me. I mean, I think that's that's right. That you know, not just as Ted Sizer said, not just schools as places for learning, but places for joy. And I know that's what we're all all aiming for. And I love how you talked about bringing what Dr. Heiler was talking about earlier in the in the program, but around really tightly bringing together teacher preparation programs in the school districts, and so doing that outreach to understand their needs and to then parallel that to what the teacher preparation program is providing. Um, Commissioner Mankin, I'd love to move back to you and ask you around the support conditions and environment that you're providing in Maine for educator preparation programs, school districts and schools to be able to have the capacity to move this work forward. Sure, yes, uh, we've created several networks and frameworks and cohorts of educators. Um, there are, let's see, <laughs> A, a list of, of some really cool things. Um, we have, in, uh, first of all, we've, we've created a whole new office in the Department of Education. It's the Office of Educator Excellence, providing all kinds of support and managing the Teach Main plan. Um, we also have designed, um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting texted right in the middle. I'm sorry about that. Um, we have, have also, Put together um, a, a collaboration with some of our key business partners um, who are helping us to develop a vision called, um, and actually um, we're eager to move some of the work in that direction. It's going to be called the Main Center for Educator Excellence or for Teaching Excellence, and that will continue the work of the peer-to-peer -peer support um, networks that we have. And um, we're we're trying we're trying to create the relational environment as you mentioned you know what what are we're providing opportunities oh another whole important thing is that um educators have been invited to work at the department of education as distinguished educators where they're able to share with their peers some of their most exciting um interdisciplinary project-based engaging instructional practices that are so key to the whole student approach and um, and so it's less of a top down from the department saying, here's how this will happen, but rather it's a peer to peer um, respectful engagement. And 
the networks have just grown and, and the comments we're getting from the field are, you know, in 20 years of education, I've never had more meaningful, powerful experiences. And so we, we're all in for creating those types of experiences for our teachers and for school leaders. Well, thank you, Commissioner. And I really like that around not just educa engaging educator voices, but embedding them as part of the development of, of policy by having them at the Department of Education. So right there on the, on the front end is a really important aspect. Um, Dr. Johnson, moving back to you, a uh, similar question. How have you found, uh, especially, especially with districts in so much need right now and needing that capacity building, how has the state created uh, the conditions, the supports, the environment for being able to move this work forward. You're on mute, Dr. Johnson. Sorry, um, I believe now that it is in such the forefront of everything that we do politically, economically. Um, I, I have believed that we have come together, to be honest, and used it as an opportunity. And so specifically, there have been more um, attempts to collaborate and bring together stakeholders. And so specifically, I mentioned we have what is called Valen in Virginia, where it's Virginia's for Learners initiatives for Virginia Department of Ed, uh, as well as a Virginia School Consortium, where we are working with aspiring superintendents, those in leadership now, principal roles, and providing coaching and mentoring to them. And then we're also bringing together various educational associations around the table, uh, working with us, informing, helping to inform practice and implement practice and policies, as well as superintendents. And so we have a specific uh, subcategory, a subgroup of statistics, excuse me, of superintendents that are specifically interested in licensure and recruitment and retention. Um, and then we have established for the first time a statewide initiative for an advisory committee for recruitment and retention. Um, and so bringing together different voices and using our state platform to bring those individuals together and trying to leverage some of the ESSER funds um, that um, we have been given over the last couple of years to incentivize working collaboration. And then I'm, I'll always come back to our teacher apprenticeship model as well, which I believe um, is one initiative that my office is directly involved with on that as well. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And again, you know, one of the through lines I'm seeing through here is not just, you know, around this focus on supporting teachers, but how to create the working conditions by, you talked about uh, the supports for superintendents and the supports right. for principals, such an important part of the environment altogether for um, thinking about educators and, uh, and their pathways. Um, Dr. Varela, turning back to you, um, again, looking up from the programmatic side, how has the state provided the support conditions environment for, for Montclair State to do this work? I mean, I think it's, you know, the constant conversations with the state, um, you know, looking at our program, seeing what programmatic features we want to address, what we want to add, what we are looking um, when we look across the state and we look at, you know, particularly funding in different districts, how do we prepare our leaders to tackle those challenges? And so I think, you know, to me, those are the things that we use what the state is giving us and we help our students interpret that, right? As well as, you know, I know that ESSER funds were such a big part of recovery. Um, but one of the things that, you know, I think my colleagues and I at uh, the Center of Pedagogy realized really quickly is that principals didn't necessarily know what to spend those things on. And so while the initial rush was to get every kid one to one hot spots, um, and, you know, I did a study with 60 principals across the country and the you know, the the trend in those interviews was that, you know, principals were like, but we have these ESSER funds, right? We're one to one or where we got hot spots, but what else can we do? And so thinking about looking at the state, you know, particularly in New Jersey, as I had mentioned with those curriculum um, adaptations, changes, or, um, you know, new curriculum initiatives, how can we help to counsel, um, districts, leaders, superintendents in particular, 
about the funding, right? Especially when we think about, again, this retaining teachers, what makes teachers wanna stay right now and what do they need? How can we support them? As well as how can we support families, right? So one of the things I think is really interesting is, you know, there's a hot button item of free lunches, right? How lunches were free during the pandemic and now they are no longer, some districts are rolling that back. And so thinking to, thinking of my school leaders that, you know, my aspiring school leaders, how I talk to them of like, what would you do? How would you talk to families about that, right? How would you extend those conversations? But then also talking with the school leaders who are in service and saying, you know, how can we help you? What do you need? Because a lot of this is so, is, you know, unfettered territory. And so I think, as we partner with the state and as we think about how to support these initiatives, our job as a university and particularly my department is how do we, how do we help, right? How do we help meet the principles, the aspiring principles where they are? How do we make sense of the things that, you know, they're experiencing? And then how does that align with, you know, the, the constituents that the, the principles lead in, you know, or for? So those are some of the things that we're doing at Montclair. Thank you, Dr. Varela. And I think that's so important where you're talking about how to use those unprecedented federal funding, not just to use the money, but to use it well. Uh, think about the intentional practices that can be supported in that way. And then re your research over time has shown in your colleagues at Montclair Skate to help um, guide districts during that time uh, of prioritization. On both I guess I'll, I'll just chime in on her comment also. I think what we have tried to do is to obviously use the data, as I mentioned before, in terms of the needs, right, and to helping us determine how to use that funding and helping them use the funding. I also would say I have tried and our staff has tried to find ways of doing short term and then some institutional or systematic kinds of things with that funding that will build a foundation, even if we don't see the results for the next 10 years, right? And I've seen some discussion about trust in the chat. And so for me, that's part of that. If we are making decisions about building infrastructure or, or trying to demonstrate that we're supporting our divisions and our principals and the students and the parents um, at, at various levels, that's building that trust and establishing the foundations that will go beyond the, the tenure for the ESSER funds, right? Um, so, yeah, can I just piggyback on that too as well? You know, I think Dr. Johnson, you you really bring up this like thing that I've seen across the school districts that I work with is what are the short term plans? Because I think a lot of schools were cash rich right. and they had they were like, what do we do? <laughs> right. Um, but I think it really became one of those things where it's like, what do we need short term? And then what do we need long term? And I think what was helpful was to your point, Dr. Johnson, of looking at the data, right? So when NAEP came out with their report that there was so much learning loss and it hasn't happened since the 70s, et cetera, <laughs> for me, it was important to talk to the school leaders and say, so what was the same prior to the pandemic? So if you've always had low achievement in math, Right. That's right. actually a systematic problem that we need right. to talk about and get into. And maybe ESSER funds could help be helpful in that way. Right. Maybe we can more training. We can think about um, a lot of diverse ways. But I think that was, you know, that's the key. And I think that's the opportunity for university partnerships is to have someone who can say, let's think dynamically about the funding. Let's look at your data and then let's see what are the short term, what are the long term. And then, you know, one of the things I always think of are what are the things that are nice to have that you can finally include, right? That maybe you want to try um, for your district. But it's so interesting to me as I prepare leaders because they've, I didn't have that as a principal. And I know my friends who were principals didn't have this moment. And so if we think about crisis as it's like consistently happening, we have to train our aspiring leaders to think financially and programmatically. What do you do when you have a cache of money and you have problems presenting again, what do you do next?
really helpful uh, conversation between the two of you and uh, both thinking about the short and long term. Um, I wanted to go back to you, Dr. Johnson, a little bit to talk about the apprenticeship program. I know that's what a number of states are looking at right now, um, particularly on cross-agency collaboration, you know, how you've been working uh, with the Department of Labor and how those conversations have, have gone to be able to do so. You're on mute. Sorry for the third time. I think because of the crisis level, I think people are more receptive. Um, we all have gotten stuck in our own silos, right? We all at, at, at the state level. But I think because of the, the kind of the pressure on the pot, right? There has to be some collaboration. We are working towards some of the same goals. Uh, and I think for the first time, teaching profession became part of that workforce that needed support beyond the traditional uh, support. And so I believe that uh, obviously there were some models that I use um, that inspired me around the country. I think there are about 11 or so programs now um, that are registered teacher apprentice programs. Uh, we've had youth apprenticeships in the country for years, but as we know, the teacher apprentice model is new because now the Department of Labor has recognized that. And so that really kind of has emphasized and brought attention on the needs and the education workforce, right? Just like all the other important key relevant um, professions. And so for us in my department, it was an easy connect and learning about the resources. That's kind of how I started those conversations, learning about the types of resources that could you know, that would be available from, for, from the federal side of things to divisions as employers and to individuals for tuition or other support. Again, another opportunity, right, if the state took on some additional responsibilities to collaborate and move forward with that. And so we had great partners with our Virginia Department of Labor and Industry. Um, they had the staff that worked with me one-on-one -on -one for hours as we worked through that process. Um, I also, there were various networks in the nation. There are various individuals that have led the initiatives in other states. And so there are some very great networks that are out there um, and individuals that were offering services. But uh, I guess I found that because of the knowledge of Virginia licensure, right? And I wanted to ensure that our program included the capabilities of individuals to come through and be successful with uh, obtaining a degree and obtaining the job and being successful on the job as well as licensure, right? So we really needed the content and someone that had the skills in the state's licensure to work with the Department of Labor. And so again, it, it was a time of learning um, myself and other staff, the few staff that we had that could work on this initiative. Really, it was an opportunity for, for exploration, for research, to collaborate with other states. So again, that networking um, and developing new relationships led us to making choices about the model for the apprenticeship, because there are several models out there. And so in our state, part of my background in teacher prep also led me to emphasize and understanding that that's a piece of the puzzle that we can't leave out. And so the model in Virginia is specifically a collaborative between the division as the employer, the EPP providing that technical uh, support and assistance and the state really serving as the intermediary with the registration and much of the administrative responsibilities. Again, knowing that the divisions are interested, they need support, but how can the state take on some of that burden for them? And so that research, um, we are now in, in the implementation phase and have some initiatives related to the, our ESSER funds. So for me, that's creating some structures and incentivizing them to build structures. I'd love to see um, this year that we have new positions across the, the, the Commonwealth, specifically a title of educator apprentice and really unpacking and making the process and transparent routes to licensure. So see lots of benefits on all sides and bringing in the collaboration, I call it the innovative collaboration with the EPPs who are now also working with divisions they never had worked with before, right? Um, and looking at their curriculum, as we've mentioned, making sure it's relevant, talking about uh, feasibility, sustainability, collaborating around those pieces. And so uh, I'm just looking forward to the implementation over the next few years, right? Um, and so we're at the very beginning of that. And so enjoying that, um, again, as an opportunity that has come through that kind of pressure 
that has forced us together. But the Department of Labor, they already had a, a governance board in Virginia set up. So again, have been doing this quite for many years and have you know very elaborate governance structures and process and procedures in place, but now are coming together with the Department of Ed to initiate this new program. So if you can tell, I'm kind of excited about that. <laughs> I can, we can tell your excitement. It's really helpful to walk through how you were able to develop or strengthen those uh, partnerships between education and labor and the EPPs to, to get a newer model, um, but to make sure it's high quality as well. Um, Commissioner Mankin, I wanted to move back to you and then we'll go to a question or two that have, have come in uh, while we've been, we've been having the conversation. And I'll just, before I go to you, I'll just uh, mention that at NGA, we recently finished up a 15-month uh, project, technical assistance project, with six governor's offices, three Democratic, three Republican, on uh, being able to support them on student well-being and uh, from within and beyond the, the pandemic. And we saw two themes as part of that project across all six states. One was that cross-agency collaboration. There had been so much collaboration between health and education and human services on the health and safety side during the pandemic that wanting to continue what Dr. Johnson was saying, those continue those relationships going forward once they were uh, made during the pandemic, but to address well-being. And then the other is engaging parents and families and students and communities to be able to get this uh, work done. Governors having community conversations on well-being with those, with those different stakeholders. Uh, so Commissioner Mankett, just want to ask you, um, you know, how have you engaged parents and families and students um, coming out of the pandemic and during the pandemic on this work, both whole child and educator recruitment retention? Right. Well, you know, the years, the year leading up to the pandemic, which we could never have expected to happen, um, our state uh, re-energized a cross-agency children's cabinet, and that includes Department of Education and the Department of Health and Human Services but also public safety and Department of Labor and even Department of Corrections. And all of us would meet quite regularly to, to develop what essentially is a whole child framework for how from, from birth to you know, well into adulthood, how are we going to support the young people and also the young people who are the young parents and families. And we've created um, a variety of supports, our state, before the pandemic, we had our own emergency of sorts, and it continues uh, to rage on today. We have a terrible opioid epidemic in our state, and we recognize that the key to strengthening young people who are in homes where substance use disorder is, is prevalent, where um, you know there may not be as much modeling or support for them, they, the more we can offer in education to strengthen them in their decision-making and in their um, understandings um, around health, making healthy choices and how they can have agency within even the context of being a young child in a very um, challenging situation. So we've been working really well um, with that children's cabinet model and there are several subcommittees working within that. And I, I would just put in there that to have a whole child approach to education, you need a whole adult approach really to the educators, the school leaders, the district leaders. We didn't mention that, but with, and, and I did notice one of the comments saying, you know, with school leaders turning over so quickly because these jobs have almost, they've become untenable. The classroom has never been so hard, never been so polarizing and divisive and denigrating, really. Um, it used to be that you were proud to be an educator. When I first became a teacher, I was in the middle of filling out an application for an apartment. And when I could put occupation teacher, I remember thinking, boom, I'm going to get this apartment. I'm probably going to get a discount. They're going to be so happy to have an educator in, in the building. And it was, it was a time when education was really re respected. And we have come such a far way away from that. And I just feel like the more we can do to develop trust in our education system, to develop trust in our education educators and our school leaders, the more chance we have of holding on to essentially the underpinning of all democracy, which is our public education system. Well, thank you, Commissioner. That's really helpful. And um, you know, in terms of bringing 
new individuals into the classroom, one of the questions we had in the, the chat was around paraprofessionals. And um, if any of you have uh, something to, to add on pathways and supports that are being provided right now for paraprofessionals and making sure they can get into the classroom. I can um, start if that's okay. Um, I would say I love this question because I think it's such an untapped resource. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of times the paraprofessional education assistant just becomes the handholder or the bodyguard. And I think that, you know, in my experience, you know, you take that job because you really love kids and you, you really want to be, um, you want to be in the classroom or in a school. So what I would say is one of the things that you want to do is assess where your paraprofessionals and educational assistants are and create a learning plan for them particularly. I think sometimes I see school leaders just dump them in a PD and then struggle with the engagement because they may not have the background knowledge that they need uh, to engage in the work. I think, you know, sometimes we forget how much training teachers do, right? It's a highly intellectual profession as is leadership. And so for me, when you're thinking about how to support them, it's really understanding where they are, creating their own professional learning plan, resources, materials that they can go through uh, with someone similar to how you would induct a teacher, right? They need their own time. There are times where you can loop them in, but I do think it's important to acknowledge them. Um, and so I think that to me is the biggest thing, right? Is that you treat them with the same professional respect intellectual respect and you de you design a, a learning plan for them. I think in thinking about the commissioner's response too is that you know I just wanted to add if we're thinking about whole child policy and supporting children, I do agree that we have to think about how do we support whole child adult learning. And so thinking critically about how do your adults learn in the building? What are the best ways in which they're taking feedback? How do they take feedback? What are the wins? Um, I think that's the next level of work for a lot of leaders to, in, to transform their schools into whole child schools is understanding how do I support the whole adult? Um, and I think with that is also, you have the same mindset for educational assistants and paras. And I always say, you know, you promote what you permit. So if you value paraprofessionals, but you take them out of the professional learning to do coverage, that actually signals what you're promoting, right? And so what I would say is, in order to support them, you definitely want to give them, um, what is that called when it's like isolated time, right? Where you don't let them do it. This is a learning time for them. I think those kind of moves signal to them that you are investing in them, that you're taking them seriously, but also giving them the genuine space that you would want for a student to learn and to grow. I'll piggyback on that one. Exactly what you said. I'll, um unpack a little bit more about the apprentice model that we are developing and implementing in Virginia, which I believe um, does exactly that, colleague. Um, the target audience for the apprenticeship model is the grow your own perspective with targeting paraprofessionals, uh, instructional aides, long potentially substitutes, could be part-time positions as well, as well as EPP candidates. And so the apprentice will have a two-year period which they are not the teacher of record and they are mentored, right, by a journeyman, they say, or an expert teacher um, for that two year period. And really, this will be the first time that we're building a model for training mentors, right? Um, and we'll have certain expectations and responsibilities that go along with mentoring this apprentice and that they will be using our state's performance standards for teachers as part of a competency-based review system. So as they go through the two years, there will be competencies, specific outcomes and deliverables that that mentor will be working with them, as well as them taking the classes, right? As well as what we call the on-the-job training where they're getting certain amount of hours over the two-year period. And many of these, again, are anchors in the federal 
Department of Labor's apprenticeship programs. But again, I think it's a beautiful match with uh, much of what you've shared in terms of working with the adults in the system, those that have really made the commitment to the children and to the division um, and trying to, for us, upscale some of our residency programs as well. So using that model of co-teaching or the apprentice would be two examples of how I feel like we're doing that as well. Well, great. Thank you all for the conversation today uh, and uh, sharing your insights. I'm going to pass it back to Jen to close us out. Thank you, Seth. And I wish we did have more time for this conversation. It's been so great. Um, thank you to Commissioner Megan, Dr. Johnson, and Dr. Varela for everything that you brought to this conversation. Um, and thank you to our amazing co-sponsors. Um, as I said earlier, today's webinar is the fourth in a six-part series on transforming state education policy through a whole child approach. A recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint slides will be made available shortly. In the chat, you can find a link to learn more about the entire series and register for the next webinar on April 12th, which will explore how states can invest resources equitably and efficiently to support whole child systems and school design. We also have a survey in the chat if you have a minute to complete. Um, thank you all for attending and we hope to see you in April.